in Stanley's story of AI, mecha, mechaniques, mechanical simulations of human beings are designed uh, according to the tasks that they are built to perform. There are au pair or nanny mechas. I have many good references. There are chef mechas. Jude Law plays a lover mecha named Gigolo Joe. I know all about women. Mechas are basically made to, in a sense, ease the burden of humans' lives, at the same time putting many humans out of work and creating a kind of class struggle. But there are many different kinds of robots in AI, a lot of them worse for wear because of the fact that they've been abandoned by their owners, turned loose. And once these robots are turned loose, they lose their operating license. And once they have no operating license, it is open season for the characters like Lord Johnson Johnson, whose job it is to gather up all the garbage, all the antique iron, as he puts it, of robots that have been turned out, castaways, and to retrieve them and bring them to these large kind of event carnivals called flesh fairs where they tear the robots apart for the general amusement of the human being. And David, of course, and Gigolo Joe are always on the run trying not to get caught by those who are snatching unlicensed robots and putting them in the flesh fairs. They made us too smart, too quick, and too many. We are suffering for the mistakes they made because when the end comes, all that will be left is us. Robot design started about four months before production. Every robot is different, and Stephen was very specific about this. In the very beginning, he said, you know, let your imaginations go, and the design concepts were very, very extreme, but there was always an element of humanity in every robot, and uh, Stephen wanted to hold on to that humanity of the artificial intelligent world. I'm accustomed, job. 75 years ago, I was Time Magazine's Mecca of the Year. So our robots range from completely mechanical robots to makeup designs that we created here for actors wearing heavy prosthetics. My time? Is it up already? In the case of like the gardener, which is a completely animatronic puppet, there would be no human component that would play part of that role. It was decided early on that this would just be a puppet and that there wouldn't be a, a human component, there wouldn't be a, a CG computer generated version of this to augment performance and things like that. I still work, don't I? I can work in the dark, but my lamp is broken. So we pretty much knew on the outset, character by character, how much of their performance would be based on a puppet. Could you kind of shoot me over? Thing. How much would be based on an actor playing that robot? Or how much would be created later on by ILM as a computer-generated character? There's a robot, The Welder, who's played by Dave Smith, who is an amputee and a friend of mine who is one of the principals in an organization called Stuntsability, where the actors with disabilities are used there for you making their disabilities abilities. And so here is a robot that one of his arms is a welding tool. And it's perfect to be able to use, you know, an amputee in a situation like that. There were many amputees used in all of the designs. And with that, some of the most inspiring actors on the set were the various uh, amputees who acted as robots. Flesh Fair was, for the robots, their first major scene. It was 16 weeks into the build, and we had 20-some puppets that we knew would be working for one week straight. We had taken great care in making sure that in the cage sequence and for all the torture devices that we worked through with the art department and Michael Lantieri's crew, the special effects crew, to make sure that we could operate all of these characters. The cage sequence was the major scene that we knew that all of our robots would be working in simultaneously. In the cage, we had the full range of characters from actors performing under prosthetic makeups. We had amputees wearing special prosthesis that we made for them so that they could move around and still look like their limbs were falling apart. History repeats itself. 
There is an homage to Stan in it. The guys here just couldn't get away without doing it. They insisted, so the insecurity guard, which is a robot that I love, but not just because he was, uh, you know, I sort of, I just loved the robot. The design of him is based on me. We had fully animatronic puppets, cable puppets, rod puppets, hydraulic puppets, all radio controlled and rod puppeteered. The cage itself was built over a, a six foot pit that they dug into the floor of the Spruce Goose Dome. While there were 20 some performers and puppets up above, there were 20 to 25 puppeteers right underneath them doing all the movement on cable controllers. We had another 20 puppeteers outside with radios, a total of 46 puppeteers and technicians were required for the flesh fair sequence where all of our robots would be working simultaneously. It was a massive undertaking to get them all up and running and performing to camera, all in the same shots. Teddy, this is David. Hello, Teddy. Hello, David. We designed our first Teddy just as a prototype, what he would look like, showed him to Stephen. Stephen had his comments. We went back and for a couple weeks did some redesigning, adding different characters of color and light and, and structure to give Teddy a, you know, a very relatable appearance, yet a, a certain uniqueness for the story. Then we got into the technical aspect of how is he going to work. How are we going to do as much as we can live, which is always the, the scenario. We knew going in that we weren't going to be able to do everything Teddy does with a live teddy bear. Again, again it was going to be this hopefully seamless blend between live action and the CG world. There will be some incredible CG teddy work uh, in AI. But from a live action standpoint, we wanted to be able to do as much as we possibly could do. David. We did a lot of testing um, as we were going along building Teddy. We built uh, basically a, a very simple rod bear to begin with, just uh, muslin and foam and jointed it just to see what the best movement would be, how, how easy or difficult it would be to get different body positions, the different gait of his walk whilst he's doing it. And it kind of progressed gradually from there. And we learned a lot just doing very simple tests to see, make sure that everything worked well before you go into production on what the real bear would be or any puppet. There were six puppeteers uh, to perform Teddy for the arms, the head, the body, the legs, uh, facial features. Usually we use cables to control the lips, but uh, on this show we decided to use paddles, which would make the, uh, the lips move a little faster and get the more pronunciation in the, uh, the words that we needed. You will break. It was uh, probably the most difficult puppet that uh, I've ever worked with, or, or in fact any of the other guys have either, just because we had to take this character all the way through the movie. We did look at um, uh, videos of uh, Winnie the Pooh and other bears in film history to get the different types of uh, walks that were available. Eventually, it kind of boiled down to what I could actually perform in the suit. We had a rig where I would be uh, attached to Teddy. He would be in front of me about three foot, and my feet are connected to his feet. It was kind of like skiing, almost. What do we do? We run now. So I went over and recorded all my lines totally out of any context. I had no idea where it fit in the context of the story, and which is part of the reason why I'm on the set every day, because we have the lines, and the puppeteers have been able to work with the lines. Be careful, David. This is not a toy. And they had to have that in order to really learn how to, to make the face look real. But then Stephen will say, well, when you recorded it, it was too much emphasis this way, or it wasn't conspiratorial enough, or whatever, and we'll redo them right on the set. And they'll feed it into the computer. And then we could just uh, basically press a button, and uh, Teddy would perform the dialogue that Jack had given us. Be careful, David. This is not a toy. Jack gave a lot to uh, Teddy's performance uh, just through his, his voice. Just the inflections that he had really helped us so that we could actually give different uh, body movement to help sell that piece of dialogue that Stephen had. He had a series of expression heads that would range from his hero head, which 
within itself would reach many, many ranges of expression because there were 24 servos operating that little head. So he had a good range of expression just in the hero head itself. Then we had a happy head, which, you know, had a broader smile. We had a sad head. We had a concerned head, you know, a, a curmudgeon uh, face. We had these various expression heads, and each of them were interchangeable with the hero body. Then we also had a self-contained teddy, where everything was self-contained and could be carried around and also had a limited amount of performance, body movement and arm movement and Haley Joel could carry the Teddy around with him. Teddy literally worked every day of a 67-day shooting schedule. That's unheard of with a robotic or animatronic. I am not a toy. Once you've had a lover robot, you'll never want a real man again. Jigolo Joe was from a design concept, again, he was one of the stars, and the design concept of him was a very, very, very difficult one for us to nail. When we were uh, developing Jude's character, we did a lot of testing. We were trying to use um, a product called silicone, which has recently been used quite successfully in a couple of other films, and we wanted to develop a really great look for Jude using the silicone because it would be the perfect thing to use on somebody who was looking synthetic. And we did several tests with him, different designs of full face synthetic looking people. And we found that it kind of was a little bit too surrealistic. It didn't really reflect Jude's warmth and his friendliness, which we really wanted to have. We were ready to, ready to get made up. <laughs> we are, we're ready to get made up. Right. What we wound up doing is we wound up going to using a very simple prosthetic on his jawline. And in that case, then I had to go develop a look for him that would still give him that kind of plasticized look, but which would be flexible enough so that it wouldn't crack on his face. So through many, many tests, we finally found a configuration that we could actually use foam latex prosthetics in conjunction with a, a layering technique, which I developed to create this plasticized look on his face. So I think it was very successful. His hair it was also something that we wanted to make. We're thinking, well, if they can develop this robot, then they definitely are gonna be able to give him human-looking hair. So we tested with wigs, and we found that we didn't like the look of that. So what I wound up doing was, after his hair was styled, um, I made a stencil that would go all around his hairline. And what I did was I airbrushed within his own hairline to make it look like perhaps underneath where they put the hair in, they had like a form that they, they sprayed on so they knew where to put the hair in. Kind of like, a, almost like a doll. Done. That's all, folks. This is an extremely ambitious, busy, busy movie that is a completely artificial world that had to be designed and created and shot. This is without a doubt the most ambitious movie I have ever worked on in my career. To create an artificial being has been the dream of man since the birth of science. You're a machine. I'm a boy. My name is David. 